Nani, who's very, very kindly agreed to be an add water and mix type moderator and has jumped in to save the show. Sunil, please welcome. And big hand to him for taking this on. Oscar Guardiola Rivera, welcome on stage. Rana Mitter, Jalu Gu, Dipankar Gupta, and Lord Meghnath Desai. Please join us all on stage. Are we short a chair? We are, in fact. We're short a chair. We need another chair for Lord Desai. So as you can see, the universe expands infinitely, and so does this panel. But I'd like to, um, like to just start off by once again thanking Sunil. Sunil Kilnani, many of you will know from uh, his landmark book, The Idea of India. So Sunil is the author of that, as well as the director of the King's Institute at King's College London. I'll leave it to Sunil to introduce the rest of the speakers, and this promises to be another great panel. So please, uh, again, I'd request those of you sitting in the aisles to, to leave some space for people to walk through so as you don't block it entirely. Um, once again, my humble request that questions be questions, not soliloquies, statements, and declarations. And uh, that'll help a lot in, in keeping things moving. All right, I think uh, we've got underway. So over to you, Sunil, and thanks again to all of you for joining us. Great, well thank you, um, and good morning. Um, we have a, a very ambitious title, <laughs> and we have also a large panel of speakers. So we should probably move straight off into the uh, discussion, and then we'll open it up for questions in the last 15 minutes or so. Our title is Who Will Rule the World? And we live broadly in a democratic age, at least when it comes to uh, the internal standards of legitimacy that most states are held up to. But certainly at the international level, uh, it's much more a world of raw force, power, and the capacity to coerce or get your will uh, fulfilled. So there's a kind of discrepancy between, on the one hand, I think our commitment to some notion of democratic consensus rule within states, but a very a sense that at the international level we're very, very far from that. So the question of who rules the world is actually quite a significant one in, in the sense of who is able to set the terms, the norms, the, the international rules by which all sorts of activities are governed from today from uh, trade, uh, climate change, to cyberspace, to the, uh, the management of space itself. Um, these are matters that are settled uh, in the international domain, but certainly not by uh, democratic means. So there is, a, uh, I think, a, a, a tension. And, and this question of who rules the world, or who will rule the world, is, uh, has real uh, force and implications to it. Um, it's a sense, in a sense, it's a question that uh, takes us back to the time of empire, um, when the question of who ruled the world was contested by Western powers. But we have today um, a panel, uh, and I'll just in briefly introduce them, and then we'll get the discussion going. So I have first uh, on my right here, uh, Professor Rana Mitha who is director of the China Center and also no, 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 professor no, no, no. of history at Oxford University. And he has just published a book on the uh, Second World War, China's play, role in the Second World War and its war with Japan. And he will talk to us about China. I then have immediately on my right here, um, Professor Dr. Oscar Guard Guardiola Rivera, who is at Birkbeck College at the University of London. And he, in the Department of Law there, and he has just published a, a book w by the title of What If Latin America Ruled the World? To my left here is uh, Zalu Gu, who is a, a filmmaker and a novelist as well. Um, and she uh, has just published a, a novel uh, called, I'm sorry, I Am China. Not yet. Uh, it's about to come out in, in this, later this year, called I Am China. 
So she will also give her perspective on the place of China in the international order. And then to my left here is Professor Dipanka Gupta, uh, who has been professor for many years at JNU University and has published in recently a book called The Caged Phoenix, Can India Fly? And then to my further left here uh, is Lord Meghnad Desai, uh, who has published books from film to economics to history. And he will give, I think, an unlikely defense of the continuing dominance of the West uh, in the international order. So I think let's start first with the, the, the this question of China, because clearly that is a, a nation which has been moving very rapidly to the forefront and about which many claims have been made about its future role in the international order. So Rana, would you like to sure. say something about China's prospects for dominating a world or creating a world order in its own image? Sure. Thanks very much, Sunil. Well, um, Xiaolu Guo here has written a book called I Am China. I have to confess I am not China, <laughs> but I'm going to have to try and do my best to speak on China's behalf. And I think the case I'd like to lay out to run through the discussion is that whether China is going to rule the world or not is one question. I think that's going to be a relatively hard case to make. But in one sense, it's an easier case to make than for any of the other countries, regions, polities that we're talking about today. In other words, I think China is setting the challenge, is setting the standard which the other groups and regions have to answer. I remember just over a year ago, I was not far from here in New Delhi at another very interesting conference um, at which the subject of debate put forward between two sides was, will India or China rule the 21st century? And my starting point, speaking on the Chinese side, I think they thought it was amusing to get someone of Bengali background to get up and speak on behalf of the Chinese. I did point out that the last Bengali to speak in favor of an East Asian power was Subhas Chandra Bose back in the 1940s, and that didn't work out so well. But nonetheless, speaking on that side, I pointed out that the reverse of the situation, that same debate being held in Beijing, would be utterly unthinkable. I don't know that anyone in the center of Beijing's policy-making elite would decide that what we need to do is to have a debate about whether India or China is going to dominate the world. And I'm afraid, for good or ill, the terms of trade in terms of that global dominance are being set by China as the challenger and not by India, or even, I have to say, Oscar, by the countries of Latin America. And since if we each went on for um, uh, too long, it would be a very long session. I want to let others get in. I'll just make a couple of very quick points as to why I think the Chinese challenge is there and has to be answered. Number one is the obvious but necessary realization that economic power is not everything, but it is of significance. In terms of per capita GDP in China, we are now at something like 8,000 US dollars per person. That compares with India's rate of approximately, I think, three and a half thousand US dollars. In other words, in terms of these two challenges alone, the gap between the two is still very wide. Even if China continues to grow at a much slower rate than the last decade of phenomenal growth of eight, nine, ten percent a year to a more moderate two to three percent, and believe me, in the UK at the moment, we would be delighted with a growth rate of that sort. We are still talking about a very large gap between the two. In other words, economic value, capital, that enables the Chinese to do more of what they want to do. The second point, and again, this is the hardest one to do anything about, is that geography is, at least in part, destiny. It's not always the case, but there probably is a very good reason why, in no scenario I can think of, is New Zealand going to rule the world in the next 100 years, <laughs> or that any New Zealanders or Aussies in the audience may want to, uh, to combat that. In other words, China being at the center of the fastest growing area of geopolitical and economic strength in the world, the Asia Pacific, is going to be tremendously important in terms of that, uh, that change. And the third point is, of course, that the impact of China everywhere is visible. In Latin America, CCTV, China's central television, now has 12 international bureaus. That's seven more than CNN, which is normally thought of as the main um, American-based international competitor. In Africa, the number is 20. 
Now, television programs don't spell influence on their own, but they say something about reach, ambition, and also interaction. And those are things that are happening at the same time that the Western companies, the BBCs, the CNNs, and so forth of this world, are beginning, I think, to lose that sense of confidence. The final element that I will put in is the one that isn't yet there, and that is liberalization and democratization. Now, so far, China is doing the world a great favor because the Chinese Communist Party, by refusing at the moment to liberalize and democratize, is giving the rest of the world, including India, an excuse to say, yes, you've done this, yes, you've done that, but your people are not free. And that is an entirely accurate accusation. But if you remove that obstacle, if you remove the one misleading thought that's really at the center of Chinese communist thought, that their growth has been because of authoritarianism, despite it, then I think the Chinese have a proposition that is very hard for the rest of the world to answer. Economic growth, a stabilizing social system, and democracy, I think that that would be a very, very difficult combination to beat in a competition to rule the 21st century. Okay, well thank you, Anna. So economic power, geography, the visibility, the growing footprint, and a kind of gradual move towards liberalization. Four elements that Irana thinks is going to kind of push China into a dominant role in the coming world order. Zhelu, let's go to you for your comments on, on how you think China might shape up in, in coming years before then we look at some of the other contenders okay. for this position. Is this okay, the sound? Okay. Um, my, my tone often sounds quite anarchy, but I'm going to try to be systematic and uh, not uh, destructive. Okay. So, um, because my position is a kind of artist, you know, I work for myself. So in a way, I always, always try to run away from the big subject. I try to kind of comb out a kind of individual personal view on things, have a certain distance towards all kinds of big voice. Um, but uh, one thing, uh, one thing ponders me is um, what if what e essentially rule the world is a culture or eco economy. Now we say American economy now. At the moment, steel is number one, China is number two. But the culture, the whole world, the, the power of culture is American culture at the moment. Because of the Hollywood cinema, American literature, American soap, American lifestyle permeates every corner of the whole world. From, from Eskimo world to New Zealand, to China, to Japan, too far anywhere in the world. So the Chinese culture was never a major um, seen in, in the whole global uh, scenario. Although, let's say, take 10 years or 20 more years, the Chinese economy will be definitely, solidly will be number one. But was well, the Chinese culture the major force of the, of the cultural phenomenon nowadays? I, I don't think so. Um, because the Chinese, what's going through the Chinese culture is Americanization. So like me, I speak English. I don't speak other language other than Chinese. Um, way in China, most educated people speak English, but most educated people in the West don't speak Chinese, mm. which means the culture exchange is a very one-way culture exchange. And it, I always believe, essentially, culture is the most powerful, profound force because that changes your lifestyle. But at the moment, I don't think, you know, other than China, no one living the Chinese lifestyle, which is more really kind of the, the deep love is towards nature, a, a certain kind of Zen Buddhism, the nature, um, more kind of spiritual world, which is lost in contemporary China. So essentially, I, I would think if the cultural force in China is as strong as the economic force in the next 20 years, yes, we can talk about China, you know, it is a dominant force. At the, at the moment, <coughs> the Chinese force is slave force. It's a labor force. It's a, it's a kind of a low, um, non, non-cultured, non-intellectual force, and it plays bad image in the world. And I really, I would cry for the cultural force, which demands the double way of communication. You should learn you know, some kind of Chinese language, or Chinese culture, or Chinese literature, Chinese cinema. I think very important, as you know so well, American culture. Great, well thank you. I think that leads very nicely to bringing in the, the, the question. Uh, of India in this context. Um, Dipanka, I mean, this point about uh, the force of ideas and the broad, more broadly of sort of cultural 
uh, images and symbols and, and, and power, uh, as opposed to purely economic or military power. Do you think that that has some relevance in how you would imagine India's future in coming years in terms of world power? Well, you see, I have a problem because I don't think we really should think of becoming a world power. In fact, why should we think in terms of ruling the world? Isn't that a rather damaging statement to make to start with? Um, uh, I think the most important question should really be, how can we rule ourselves before we rule the world? And we haven't quite got, we haven't quite got around to doing that. Um, remember, from the 50s till almost the 90s, we had two great powers trying to rule the world, and what a mess they made of everything, including us, the Cold War. The Cold War was a bruising time for, for the world. In fact, most of us forgot about democracy altogether. It was all about capitalism versus communism, the good guys and the bad guys. It didn't really matter whether it was a mass murderer or a certified killer, so long as you were on my side. Yeah. That was the most important thing. Do you not want to rule the world that way? Why, why should anyone want to rule the world? Yeah. The more important thing is how well do we deliver to our people? That is what blows my hair back. It's not ruling the world. If you want to give that some real legs to stand on, then I'd say, look at Denmark, Norway, Finland, Sweden. They don't think of ruling the world, but they rule themselves rather well and rather tidily. And most of the people in these countries are very happy about their societies. And they don't care a damn about who's ruling the world. In fact, I remember having a discussion with some uh, experts from the Nordic countries, and I said to them, listen, you've lost it. The Americans are better than you in productivity. They invent more things, and they are certainly ruling the world. And they say, well, let America go ahead and do that. As far as we know, we're not going to let old people lie in gutters, single mothers look around for support, children without parents, you know, who are gone in school. We think that is the most important thing. We want to get a society in place first, and we let the economy work its way around it, instead of the other way. And I think this is the real question we should ask. Do we want to really rule the world, or should we rule ourselves? You know, I've been waiting for a long time for India to rule Indians. And that is yet to happen. And I, the reason why it is not happening is because we've taken our eyes off the ball. We get so mesmerized by the metaphors of ruling the world, the cultural things of Hollywood and so forth. You know, and in India, you know, we have a problem anyway. We are neither black nor white. We're kind of brown, so we're in the middle. So that itself is a bit of a non-starter if you want to rule the world. You know, and, and as, far as, uh, as far as ruling the world is concerned, we are so mesmerized by those symbols. In fact, I would say, Cut out those symbols. Forget about, forget, about, forget about all of that, because that really promises you lunch and a taxi fare back home free of cost, but doesn't take you anywhere really. If you want to get someplace, then I think you should pay attention to what countries like Denmark, Norway, Sweden have done. The more healthy the economy in terms of this, the way it looks at its own people, the more prosperous it is, and eventually those countries will rule the world without even attempting to do so. And I would like India to be in that grade. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, Oscar, thank you, Defunto. Oscar, from where you stand in Latin America, uh, does Scandinavia look like the future that you all want to move towards? Let, let, me, let me begin by saying that uh, I would humbly uh, submit to you that Lord this I should uh, rule the world. That would be a really nice prospect. Uh, of course, I could say well, that. Uh, it really is. We, I have, we'll, we'll take a vote on that later, but for the we moment. <laughs> Of course, I could say that uh, if Latin America were to rule the world, uh, uh, well, we would have uh, better dancing, great football, and uh, the world would be happier and more senses. And I do, do think that is the case. But as uh, we just uh, heard, when we ask the very question, who will rule the world, we are in danger of repeating the very wrong assumptions and uh, uh, repeating the very wrong consequences that uh, the struggle to solve that very question uh, had in the 20th century. Uh, in my uh, uh, previous book, What if Latin America Ruled the World, and more recently in my current uh, uh, book, A Story of a Death Foretold, which uh, tells the story of uh, the U.S. intervention in Latin America in the, uh, during the very uh, creative period of the 1960s and 1970s, when uh, the countries of Latin America, but also the other countries of the so-called Third World, India among them, came together and in coming together challenged the very idea of someone ruling the world. 
Uh, and uh, I believe that it, is, uh, 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 it would be a tremendous mistake if we uh, repeat uh, that very same question under the assumption that uh, someone who, has, uh, uh, who is producing, some country which is producing the most cars, uh, uh, which has the biggest uh, uh, income per capita ratio and has the biggest guns, is the one uh, who uh, uh, should rule the world. And whether it be China or Brazil uh, who uh, would rule the world in those terms, that would not change the picture at all which means that we must acknowledge that the, the terms of the conversation are changing. Our conversation should not be whether someone, some country, uh, some community should rule the world, but rather whether in doing so we are doing a favor and or a disfavor to the entire world as such. Because we must also acknowledge, as uh, the Indian historian Dipesh uh, Chakravarti has told us, uh, that uh, the very same uh, processes which gave us uh, more freedom uh, during uh, 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 part of the 20th century are now also turning us into geological agents, not only historical agents. What we do now changes the climate. What we do now impacts upon the very processes of nature and the world beyond us humans. And if that is the case, then we must also acknowledge that it is no longer a good question to ask whether we should, uh, uh, we, whether this or that country should rule the world, but rather whether we should, uh, we're, we're absolutely uh, ready to acknowledge that in uh, uh, creating these uh, huge uh, uh, economies, these uh, globalized economies, we're also endangering uh, the ecosystems and uh, uh, the cosmological systems uh, that uh, other peoples, uh, for instance, uh, the Amerindians, uh, do hold on to. And I think that the one thing that uh, the rest of the world could learn from uh, uh, particularly the indigenous peoples who are now uh, in charge uh, in places such as Bolivia and the Ecuador is the way in which they are uh, proposing to us all that we should think about nature and the world as having rights of its own. Rights uh, that uh, entail that uh, nature and the world is not there for the taking, is not there for us to do with it whatever we want uh, to do with it, because in doing so we might destroy it. And if that is the case, then the question of who is to rule the world should not be answered in terms of uh, military might, of economic powers, but rather in terms of uh, the choices we're going to make which are going to make the world a place in which we all can share, live, and prosper, rather than continuing in the path uh, that we have followed since the 20th century, which has resulted in tremendous violence and in a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. That is uh, the uh, uh, very idea that uh, some governments in Latin America are following and uh, in uh, following principal decisions, such as uh, the uh, Brazilian government's uh, decision not to develop nuclear weapons, uh, not to engage in uh, 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 violence in order to uh, uh, reaffirm its place in uh, uh, the world order. That's the kind of example that uh, uh, I hope will rule the world. Great. Th thank you, uh, Oscar. Um, so we've had kind of four broad views about how this might play out. But before I turn to make that, maybe the question is sort of moving more towards who sets the rules rather than who rules the world. Who, to, who is involved in setting the rules in a world where there are more ideas of rule, more claimants to rule, and more threats uh, than we perhaps faced ever, ever before, including the threat of destroying our natural habitat. So in, for that question, Magnet, of who can continue to play uh, dominant or important roles in the setting of the rules that govern the international order, how do you see it? You know, I, I take the view that we think of the world in terms of nation states, and that is where who rules question comes up. One country has to rule, and I think that's a wrong question. Uh, I would have called Marxist revenge. People don't understand the title. It was Marxist revenge on Lenin. Uh, Lenin sort of thought socialism would come very quickly. And it failed. 20th century is a great experiment. 
Can't you be better than capitalism? Answer is you can't. You may not like it, but capitalism rules the world. Uh, you know, nothing else does. And you know, it says quite a lot of people say, oh, you know, gap is increasing rich and poor, but nobody knows because more people have been taken out of poverty in the last 50 years than ever before in the history of the world. We can talk about China and India, not because of anything else, but because they both adopted liberalization. China's, China, uh, Deng Xiaoping said, hell with uh, Maoism, hell with all liberalism, I'm going to go for capitalism, and suddenly people take notice of China. I know people don't like admitting that. But the story is that capitalism rules the world. Google rules the world, Microsoft rules the world, Coca-Cola rules the world. That's what you do. And you know, the capacity of the system to innovate, as you see from your mobile phones, as you see from a 3G, 4G, whatever system, and the penetration of those new technologies deep into popular life. Nobody expected 20 years ago that we would all be using mobile phones even in the village of Bihar. So my view is that the capitalism as a mode of production has got a lot of life left in it. And the extent that China or India wants to rule the world, they only rule the world with an economic power, which may not be sufficient, but it is necessary. I hope they don't rule the world, because rule the world is very expensive business. <laughs> and it wrecked it, it, it the British, and it wrecked the Americans now. And the Chinese are about to have, you know, a, a, a pearl, a, a, you know, a system, chain of pearls around the world with ports, complete waste of time. Complete waste of time to police the oceans and all that. Let the Americans do it, let them spend the money, you know, why, why should you bother? What, what, what matters, I think, as, again, <coughs> as the panel was saying, are you delivering a good quality of life? And I think eventually, when the Cold War ended, the Cold War wasted 60 years of, uh, sort of 50 years of uh, the 20th century. When the Cold War ended, people said, it doesn't matter which system it is. Let us see whether the people have got what they want. The whole uh, human development movement, the whole human rights movement, but I'm old enough to know that nobody talked about human rights in the 50s or 60s, you know, capitalism and socialism. After the death of Soviet Union, human rights, the rights of nature, the whole ecological movement starts. And so the world is getting better. You know, I, I think, and since this is dialectics, the bad and the good have to be together so that the dynamics of, of, of progress is that good comes with bad. And you can't have good without the bad. So I do believe that capitalism and what I call broad European culture, uh, you know, the Chinese and the Japanese, when they think of music, you know, we all think about Charles and Beethoven and all those sort of things. I don't know whether there are very many people playing Chinese classical music uh, outside China, or the Navy, I don't know. Uh, you know, we, uh, painting. What is your heritage of painting? Yes, of course, there are some Indian painters who, who do a lot of money. But, you know, come on, let's face it. Ultimately, most of what we do and what we think about and talk about came from modernity and Europe. That is what it is all about. And one final thing I want to say is, and this is somewhat unfair on the Chinese, you know, it's a language, a, a language of big barrier. You know, nobody is going to learn to write Chinese very easily, right? I, I, if, if the Chinese romanize, if, if the mean becomes universal, then I can, I can learn Chinese. I'm never going to, you know, I've been to China 10 times, but I can't read a single street sign. Uh, so I think language is power. And language will have a way of going into deep, deep into culture, and some sort of form of Romanized script and a, a, a Europeanized language uh, is actually has become a universal thing. So what rules the world is modernity, capitalism, and European culture. Sorry. Can, can, can I? Can I jump in, uh, like not very, yeah. very quickly, because uh, uh, Lord Desai has said something uh, which is uh, very important and very interesting, the power of language. Uh, and there is uh, a, a story which uh, uh, goes unreported about a, uh, a very impressive uh, process of transformation that is taking place within the United States. 
And if it is the case that uh, uh, language is, uh, is power, and I uh, take it that uh, Lord Asai and uh, you also refer to the fact that you know, we all speak English and so on. Uh, I don't know if you have been recently to the United States, but uh, uh, wherever uh, you enter the United States, you begin Spanish. to see that together Spanish. with English, there is Latin American and Spanish. Yeah. And uh, what this means is uh, that in uh, 20 to 25 years, according to demogra demographic tendencies, even if the borders of the United States are closed tomorrow, as uh, some crazy people in the Republican Party would like it, uh, the United States will become a Latin American country in uh, 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 two or, or, or three decades. And that very transformation is already challenging people in the United States to rethink uh, what they believe about their own identity and their own uh, uh, position in the world. Uh, the Latin United States means, for instance, that the, uh, these crazy Republicans are going to have a very tough time at uh, going uh, uh, to the White House. Uh, it also means that uh, certain uh, uh, priorities about foreign policy are beginning to change. Uh, and uh, also, perhaps, uh, we will see a, a very interesting uh, change in uh, culture in the United States. So just, I, I, I only wanted to uh, uh, ask for your attention to that very process, that Latin Americanization of the states. Second. Rana, you wanted to come in on this, this uh, I just pick up very briefly on a couple of the points that have been uh, made. Uh, the first point on language, and I don't know if uh, Shalom will agree with me, is, uh, uh, which I'm sure what most of in the audience would have pointed, uh, pointed out. Also, I point out that until in historical terms, very recently, let's say 150 years ago, a very large swathe of the globe, most of East Asia, used Chinese as a common language. Korean was written in Chinese characters. Yes. Japanese, as it is today, is written very largely in Chinese characters, which can be read across the region. I'm not saying that it's easy, certainly for someone coming from an alphabetic language, to learn characters in the same way. But there's nothing inherent that prevents character-based languages spreading across the world. It's a question of politics, not of linguistic structure. Also on, the question, also on the question of Western inventions and so forth, I mean, it's a whole separate, brilliant discussion we could have. I just point out we're sitting in a country that invented the zero, which does have a rather central part to play in the mathematical, economic, and technological development of the world. But the final point, really, didn't, just... Didn't the Mayans invent the zero? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say it wasn't someone in Oxford, so uh, <laughs> from elsewhere. The final point is this, and I think the, 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 the central the, 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 the final point is this. All of you, or most of you, have decided to abuse the hospitality of William Dalrymple, the organizer down there, by changing the question not from who should rule the world, which might be Costa Rica or a bunch of very nice Buddhists I know in Nepal or elsewhere, I'm sure they should rule the world, to who will rule the world. And actually there, the question of models and how minds are captured is central. And look at the conversation around the world. Yes, of course, the United States is still there. But in Latin America, Brazil, Lula, Dima Rousseff, they're talking about relations with China. Here in India, what is everyone worried about, terrified about, still remember in 1962, more than 52 years ago? It's not Latin America, it's China. In Southeast Asia, people are thinking about China. In Africa, they're thinking about China. I'm not suggesting this is because everything, or indeed anything, that China is doing is necessarily right, but it's because it's becoming more important. And the question of who will have power, rather than who ought to have power, that conversation is becoming more and more central. And if we ignore it and switch to another subject about what might be better in an ideal world, we will ignore one of the most important rising conversations can around I, the globe. Yeah, can I say something just, you just, ask just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just on that, on that point, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's come in from the discussion is that, yes, okay, so uh, an economy and a state like China may have great power, but the, what has also been emerging is this sense of, will it continue to have influence? Um, will it actually be able to convince, persuade, get people to do uh, what it may want them to do without the use of coercive force or other kinds of means. And I think that's a, an issue that maybe we could get a bit more discussion on. Uh, so I think the ecology, e ecological 
disaster. I think eventually will rule the humanity. So we took about next 200 years, which is very short term in the human history. 200 years power in terms of nation state, political power and economic power. But really, if we jump out a bit, look at further, say Gerard Diamond point of view, from Ice Age, how the humanity come out from all this uh, development, how many billion years of, of the history of the planet. So if we look much further, see, next 2,000 years, will humanity still alive on the planet? If, if humanity died, I don't think it's a disaster. We die, then, okay, other species, the planet might recover from its traumatic experience because of the human damage we have done. So eventually, I think, if a, a large country, a large power can really get hold of the, 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 the solution, or in the global sense, solution of ecological control, ecological disaster, then I think that country has certain say. At the moment, I don't think, I mean, Chinese government is doing not too bad uh, with ecological um, improvement. It was disaster last 20 years. And I think this is the first time, I mean, in India, I see so similar the, the society, the, the structure of the development is so similar. The large poverty, the quantity of the poverty of people, and then the, the elite is a rich society. And there's a very complicated social structure, the class structure. It's very similar, but then somehow the Chinese society, maybe I say, maybe five years or 10 years kind of forward a bit, because kind of, I don't think it's come down, but slightly come down. Um, look at the ecological disaster now we were facing in China. The, if one person had virus, the whole province had virus. So there's some village in China, the whole village have cancer because of water and the food we eat. And I think this eventually is gonna, gonna come, you know, come to, to get punish, <laughs> punish the human society what we have done. So I think we, I guess power eventually lays in nature, the ecological nature, you know. Oh. Do you, do you want I have two observations on this. About what Oscar said about uh, Hispanic. Uh, when when I, I was in America 50 years ago as a student, there were very few signs of Hispanic. But the big problem was, how was America going to include in its narrative black Americans? Because at that time, America still fought as a, as a wasp country, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. In 50, in over 40 years later, the black element was integrated into American narrative. And now, the Hispanic element is going to be integrated in narrative. Now, that to me, shows a fantastic capacity of a country to change and adapt. You know, I have lived in, in India for 50 years. I have served in the UK for 50 years. Now, you know, normal people say, oh, the Westerners are racist, something like that. Anytime anything happens to an Indian in the in, in UK, they say they are all racist. But I always say to people, I'm in the House of Lords. How many Nigerians are in the Rajya Sabha? <laughs> okay. Can you see any possibility? Can you see any possibility? of an immigrant person, either first or second generation. Sonia Gandhi? Becoming... I'm coming to that. I don't I'm think Nigeria was ever Sorry. part of India's without, without, um, no, without, without, without an imperial dynasty, uh, dynasty ruling it, democratically, without a husband in tow. <laughs> right? becoming vice chairman of a political party and we have a Muslim woman who is vice chairman of the conservative party. So I think, you know, a, a society's capacity for change and absorbing new influences and asking itself continuous questions as to what it is and what it means is a very strong power that European societies have got. You know, and this is, this is where I think... Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to stop because yeah. we have to move soon into questions and answers. Dipankar, you wanted to come in. On yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I thought uh, Meghnath would rule the world, but he doesn't know Chinese, so the job is still open. <laughs> closing, closing day tomorrow morning. Uh, it's, it's all very well for us to be so enthusiastic about China and the fact that it's pulled out a white rabbit out of a red hat, and the mm -hmm. white rabbit is wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and the rest of it. But really, the idea of who will rule the world is still up in the air. Why? Because you've heard the slogan, haven't you? Yankee, go home, but take me with you. <laughs> I'd like to see how many people will say, Hispaniola, go home, but take me with you. Or Chinese, go home, but take me with you. Yeah. And that is, I think, the crux of the matter. 
The reason why Europe still is a model for the world is not because Europe is ruling the world, but because there are certain examples in Europe of how to rule the societies internally. And that model is what's going to rule the world. In fact, if we look at Latin America, the reason why Latin America is doing rather well in recent times is not because Latin America is still exporting a whole lot of oil, but because in Latin America, new social policies have been put in place sure. which are actually European in inspiration. Yeah. Whether you look at the one in Mexico or La Bolsa Familia in Brazil, wherever, or Argentina, some countries don't do it and they are suffering. Those that do it are going ahead. And I think when Europe goes to Latin America, Latin America will look up. When Europe comes to India, I think India will look up. It's been a long time since we said, you know, what Bengal thinks to the rest of India thinks tomorrow. But I hope that day will come one day soon. But till that time, let's hope Europe makes a world presence on the world stage. Okay, great. So I think we'll just open it up to questions uh, in a second. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's come through is that this drive towards economic power uh, itself creates uh, tensions, internal tensions. It creates imbalances within a society. It creates structural imbalances in the global economy. We've seen that from China's uh, growth pattern, which uh, has created very difficult uh, to manage structural imbalances in the global economy. And we've also seen the way in which the economic, the pursuit of economic power creates huge ecological and environmental uh, risks and threats. And so I guess one question uh, might be, you know, how do we find ways of establishing rules to deal with those sorts of developments where the pursuit of economic power uh, actually creates instabilities at the global level, which we have to kind of find ways to develop rules that all play by, that all are willing to play by. And the other uh, point I think that has come through strongly is this importance, not just of sheer power, but of influence, of norms, of, of legitimacy, of how you govern yourself, of how you look after your own internal inequalities and how you give voice to your own internal democratic uh, uh, constituents. So those, those might be some of the ways that, that you might want to frame some of your questions from the, the audience. Um, but let's, let's hand over now to questions in the audience. We'll take one right in the middle there. Yeah, in the blue sweater. Thank you very much. Um, Lord Desai touched on... May I just say, keep your questions short, please, because we want to move, have as many as possible. Four sentences. Lord this I touched on uh, this a little bit, but why didn't any of the panelists talk about technology? Today technology is moving so fast and so much out of anybody else's control that really speaking, uh, the advance of technology is what might drive who rules the world. Okay, thank I, you. One sec. Techno we've got the technology question. Let's discuss that uh, question here. And yes, in the white jacket. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, we have two diametrically opposite viewpoints of Lord Desai and Dipankar. One is the idealistic European type and other is the real politic. But I think there is also a price of the neighbourhood we got to pay. And uh, India is in such a hostile neighbourhood. And uh, we can't help it. And somebody has got to make the rules. And that's why we are scared of China. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see, yes. That's all yeah, I yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, no, just wait for the microphone. Did you say? Did you no, pay, payment to labor, China is better than My India. question is to Oscar and Rana. Don't have uh, to worry about You talked about... Can you uh, speak up? Uh, you talked about um, the idea of protecting the ecosystem and thinking that the ecosystem is actually bigger than the economy. Uh, we see several manifestations of it in other parts of the world, like in Buddhism and in Gandhian economics. So, uh, do you think that this uh, school of thought has a place um, in, on the global platform? Okay, thank you. So, technology, threatening neighborhood, uh, and the last question. If we can just go quickly on that, who'd like to pick up on the technology issue? Yeah, perhaps, well, perhaps we can put together uh, the, can, the first Can I join the three together? And, and okay, Oscar, if you can go quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is a very, uh, a very crucial question. The crucial uh, problem that we need to solve in the 21st and the 22nd century is the question of the ecological and cosmological limits of capitalism. Not only uh, the uh, moral limits of capitalism, I'm looking forward 
to the uh, debate uh, that is going to, uh, that is being announced uh, in this festival between Michael Sandel and John Dalston Saul, uh, precisely because uh, Sandel has been correctly insisting on the need for us to begin once more a conversation about the moral limits of capitalism. Not everything, not every single aspect of society should be or could be uh, uh, submitted to the monetary uh, logic of uh, financial capitalism without precisely endangering uh, uh, not only uh, our, our society but also uh, the ecology and uh, in fact uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the way of life of uh, uh, the, all, the, all, the, uh, all that exists in, the, in this planet. And it is precisely because of that that we need to pay attention and learn le the, uh, the lessons that indigenous <coughs> peoples in Latin America, for instance, are giving us. One very good example is the constitutionalization of the rights of nature in places like Ecuador and or Bolivia. That kind of model uh, is, uh, uh, is non-Western uh, and it is uh, uh, showing an orientation that could uh, indeed uh, be a novelty, a real transformation in history. Thank you, Oscar. Devanka, you wanted to say something? Well, you know, I think this idea of e ecological balance and so forth uh, sounds very romantic and the rest of it, but it is not really non-Western. It is very Western. Exactly. And in <laughs> West, you find the best, West expression, deeply Western. the best expression of that you find in the West. <laughs> and that is something we must pay attention to. The other thing is, please be forewarned. Capitalism does not prosper and grow because of capitalists. Capitalism prospers and grows because of entrepreneurs. And without entrepreneurs, you would not have capitalism. And entrepreneurs always bring the, the adventures of, of enterprise to the broadest mass of people. Every time capitalism has prospered, it's because of some entrepreneurial effort made by entrepreneurs that has reached out to more and more people. Today we talk of telephony and the advantages of cell phone. There's again enterprise at work that reaches out to very many, many more people than you could have ima imagined. I think in future you will find other technological events happening through enterprise which will reach out to large numbers of people. Today already we're thinking of technology in terms of financial inclusion in India and that's a very big step and I'm very proud to say that I'm, I'm part of it and I want, to, want it to grow as, as quickly as possible. So technology is good only if it reaches out, but that technology which reaches out, believe me, is because of enterprise, not capitalism. Yeah. I think the, the, the whole global industrial revolution is really based on the technology revolution. And I think the history accelerated immensely because of technology um, development. So the history could have been much slowly for the 2,000 years, not much happening, just war without industrial revolution, and suddenly 200 years, the world changed, like now the whole world changed, in a very short, exactly speedy uh, format. So now it comes back to the human attitude. If the politician or the biggest corporation, the company, could employ technology in a better way or in a more humanistic way, then I think we're all saved. But so it comes back eventually the human attitude, political attitude, how we use that technology. Yeah, yeah, right, right. One is that um, there's a very long non-Western tradition in which ecolog ecological balance is very important, and that is, of course, the Chinese, in which the ideas of yin and yang have come together for thousands of years to try and bring about that sort of balance, even though it's not always very obvious at the, uh, the moment. And the second point is that in terms of where we live in the here and now, countries and nations still remain important, not least because that's where democracy is expressed best. It's very difficult to have a global election, and without the continuation of those sorts of policies, it's hard to do the kind of ecological change we're talking about. That's why China and India and the individual countries will remain important for a very long time. Okay, great. One more round of questions. One sentence questions, please. Uh, at the back there. Yeah. Yes. My question is to Professor Debanker. Don't you think that the Scandinavian model is unsustainable in the future for Denmark, let alone being inspiration for economies like India? And second, what are your views on say, it's, it's, it's related, that combination of modern governance structures to be accommodated in local indigenous, indigenous impulses, how do you think that that play out in well, India? Thank you. Common word? I don't know. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Uh, yes, the lady here in the front. Yes. Yes. Uh, none of you have brought up the issue of religion. Surely, unless the world 
is a more tolerant place of each other's religion, religion will come to the top in some okay. world war. So religion uh, and the lady here, yes. Uh, no, the one behind, yes. No, but actually the one behind. <laughs> My question is, Mr. Dubanker. Uh, so you talk about this. Uh, you spoke about uh, self-rule uh, in in the beginning. So my question is that: um, Is the society's capacity necessarily, uh, in order to aspire such dominance, is it is it necessary for a society to have such a Eurocentric approach in uh, in as a character in order to? Uh, so to say, govern the world, given cultural relativism and given the fact that every social theory uh, depends, like it, it's contextually applied. It, it is uh, depending on how, who it applies to and how it affects them. Okay, thank you. Uh, just so I'm not accused of cruelty, the lady in the white too, so, since, since you had the microphone in your hand. Yeah, I wanted to find out the views for the role of the United Nations in the 21st century from the panelists here because human society is essentially a network, increasingly networking with the help of technology, increasingly communicating, becoming intimate with the human order. And there is talk of, uh, you know, shifting the okay. evaluative parameters yeah, from yeah, we the economy to well-being. Okay, thank you, we got to make that. Do you want to come in quickly on, on any of those? Yeah, I, I think uh, one, one, of the, one of the important things is the ideas of democracy and self-rule and governance uh, actually are European ideas. I'm sorry to say this. You know, and the, the notion that the human being has his own or her own dignity, that we are socially equal, not economically equal, the fact that we have equality of rank has been achieved in Europe more than anywhere else. Uh, and this is our aspiration, our aspiration should be. In India, for example, the whole Mandal movement has been about can we have uh, backward classes be able to confront an upper caste person and look him or her in the face and say, I am your equal. That revolution is still to happen in India. It happened in China already, but it still has to happen in India. So one of the problems we have of governance and institution is Degree, equality of dignity, and we are not, not quite quite there yet. And I think by saying, oh, no, no, but our ancient civilization, etc., very often religions are the, the root of the problem where religion deny equality of people, uh, physical equality of people. For me, uh, that is central. Uh, and so uh, I'm, not, I'm not older than I'm, and as to the United Nations, uh, I, I think, you know, it will continue bungling along as it has for the last 60 years. They always say, we could not reinvent it, nor can we abolish it. So it will continue. It's not, it is not part of the solution. As long as it's not part of the problem, I'm happy. Right, thank you. Uh, Oscar, did you want to say something on it? I just, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Rana a very silly question. Uh, and, and you have to forgive me. Why is it that we don't have fundamentalist Buddhists? Why is it uh, that, uh, that well, we don't have uh, uh, that kind of religious fundamentalism among well, those that follow fu uh, liberation theology. Fund if, if you come to my talk at 5 o'clock this afternoon in the <laughs> British Airways Bata, uh, Oscar, you will hear that fundamentalist Buddhism in the shape of Nichiren and Zen ultranationalism was behind the Japanese drive to Pearl Harbor in 1940-41. If you go to Burma, I'm afraid there's some Buddhists there who are not particularly in favor of peace and love. Yeah. Buddhism, like any other religion, has its wonderful adherence and has an awful lot of people yeah. who you and I would probably not share a being. Sri Lanka. Which means, Sri Lanka which means, is another example. Which means, Lanka, Lanka, Lanka. Lanka. which means all the side that the answer to the, uh, the lady's question is uh, that we should uh, question radically the role uh, of hierarchical uh, religiosity uh, and perhaps uh, at the same time that we show respect for popular religiosity, the kind of uh, uh, heretical religiosity that is exemplified by liber Latin American liberation theology, for instance, which uh, uh, is part of the struggle for freedom and democracy, uh, that kind of religiosity should be should serve as a, a sharp contrast with the kind of religiosity that we uh, hear is defended more often, uh, which uh, reproduces hierarchy and so on. Yeah, to answer the questions addressed to me, I think the Scandinavian model 
can be reproduced and can you know, live a long, long life simply because of the fact that they've got the act together from the very beginning. And today to be a North European and say we don't believe in the welfare state is a contradiction in terms. Much as America would like them to move away from their model, from their path of development, I don't think the Europeans are still ready for it and I hope they never will. Because when we talk of the European model, don't see it as a kind of fixation with Europe. It is actually the welfare state, the way in which they run the society, the way in which they look after the people, that is what we're talking about. And it doesn't really matter whether it's in Europe, or it is in India, or it's in Kerala, or it's in Japan, it doesn't really matter very much, as long as that model is used. The fact of the matter is that America is not Europe. America has moved away from Europe a long, long time ago. The only place in the American continent that is somewhat like Europe is probably Brazil, parts of Mexico, and Canada. Canada more than anything else. So if you're talking about Europe today, don't get geographically fixated, see what is the essence of Europe and take it from there. As far as religion goes, I would say the best example would be France and the movement, the Lysithe movement in France. And France has made a great, great strides in this, not because it stops women from wearing the hijab or people from wearing a turban, but because in 1905 or 6, I'm not very really sure, the French people said that you cannot wear the cross or any religious symbol to any public place and they said that as we are attacking our own gods, we'll attack yours as well. And that is why I think the French Lysitha movement is the best model to follow. Yeah. Thank you. So we began with China and I think we should end with China too. And one thing I'll just throw in to Rana and Zelu in their concluding remarks is, if it is indeed the case that China does take on a much, much more dominant role in the global order, what, how do you see that playing out and what should we be concerned about, if anything, Rana? Absolutely. If it takes a more dominant role in the world order, if China does, it will be for the reasons that actually the last few speakers have just been <coughs> putting out and perhaps haven't been as associated with China as they might be, which is actually the development of a social welfareist model that applies not to Sweden, not to Switzerland, not to the UK, but to a very large, populous, poor, and unequal country which has gone through a whole series of wars and conflict. A country much more similar in that sense to this one, or Brazil, or countries in parts of Africa than with North uh, Europe. And the achievements so far, 95% literacy, the establishment of a rural pension scheme, the establishment of an ever higher standard of living, even with huge inequality, ecological injustice, and all of those, is part of the model that when people look at it around the world, I think they see from China. The flip side, and the other half of the answer to your question as to how this is gonna spread and help China shape norms, is the question, I think, of democratization and liberalization. I will leave you with the proposition I started with. Supposing you knew everything you knew about China and its changing social system and its flawed but real attempt to create social justice, and then you added that to genuine liberalization and democracy, something that looks much more like India in some ways, like Brazil, like Northern Europe, I think globally that would be the biggest challenge to the dominance of the United States as a global hegemon that you could imagine. And the only people stopping that happening at the moment are the Chinese Communist Party. So if anyone from Beijing is watching this podcast, maybe they might want to take it, if they really want to rule the world, and frankly it's a really bad idea for all the reasons people have put about it, but if they really want to, I think that's the switch that will trigger that change. Great, thank you. Zelu. Yeah. I think Rana analyzed very well, very well, very, very um, soberly what's, what's going on in China. And I think it's, we are not talking about China. We are talking about China in the, in the, in the, in the sense of India is, it can be called China or Japan. Japan can be, can be called American or, or Indonesia can be called another name because those names are the fundamental structure of the state, how the government uses the whole structure to control and to develop. So I, I would only say, you know, I'm really, I can only say I'm very overwhelmed by this festival, the Java Literature Festival, which is the biggest free literature festival. And you are here, not everyone's elite here. And I think you are normal people, all elite, all intellectual, all, all just normal citizens. And I think this is a format if the Chinese government have to have a first a suggestion is have a public debate as free as this, and you don't need to pay to come in, to have this equal, this, Everyone has a right to listen, to get information, to have a debate, to have a voice. That would make China better, or China as American, or Japan, or India, or Brazil. That would be the good format. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, clearly, uh, the, I, I, 
I've changed my mind. Perhaps William Dalrymple should rule yeah. the world. Well, <laughs> well yeah. I, I, I was going to say, I think but the he message. Does. He does already. I, I think the he message from already. this panel, which will go to the Chinese. Central <laughs> Communist Party headquarters, to Delhi, and to the UN, is the Jaipur Literary Festival should rule the world. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, all of you, and a special thanks to Sunil for being such a wonderful moderator at short notice. Thanks for joining us. We're back in 10 minutes with Magnificent Delusions, Hussein Haqqani and Robert Blackwell in conversation with Sham Saran. Please stay tuned.